Good morning. We're here this morning uh, studying in Proverbs again. Proverbs 5. It's called Following God's Design. It's uh, verses 3 through 11 and 15 through 18. Kind of a heavy subject, really. Uh, so just listen and uh, go along with this. It says, The seventh commandment says in Exodus 20, 14, you shall not commit adultery. Sexual intimacy outside of marriage is wrong, even between consenting adults. Of course, this includes other sexual sins mentioned in the scriptures. God has a perfect plan for how we were to use sexual intimacy from the very beginning of time. I feel that sometimes our society uh, considers the seventh commandment and asks, what's wrong with premarital or extramarital sex, or any other kind for that matter? These things are just more acceptable today, especially when they feel they can get away with it. But in the end, the experience of premarital or extramarital sex, sexual sin is going to be disappointing. It will become destructive and ultimately deadly. That's why the seventh commandment says, you shall not commit adultery. I remember Dr. Day uh, speaking on the subject of sex quite often uh, in the old days. He used to warn the youth, and of course he was speaking to the adults also, that if you were ever put in a position where it made you feel uncomfortable, that you should run away. You know, that night when the stars were all aligned, the boy would tell the girl that he loved her, all because he wanted sex. Or vice versa, it could have been the girl. He would then explain that you had better know what you are going to do before you are ever confronted with such a situation. That boy doesn't love you, he just wants sex. It would always bother me when he would say, that boy is sniffing around my daughter. What in the world does that mean anyway? Well, another preacher I served with would always say when he was describing the prodigal son, can you imagine making love to a pig? What in the world does that mean? Well, when I first began in ministry, I had a very close relationship uh, association with a pastor that wanted to begin an evangelistic team to do revivals together. We started traveling together and had many successful revivals. We had a great friendship and worked together effectively in spreading the gospel. He had been a successful pastor and a DOM of a very large association. Well, I hadn't heard from him uh, in several weeks, so I checked on him. What had happened is that he was having an affair with his secretary. What happened to him? Well, I guess he just couldn't help it, maybe. It ruined his ministry, his family, and our newly formed revival ministry. So what was the excuse? Do we just say that he couldn't help himself? Now that we have broken the ice, uh, if we study Proverbs, it would be impossible to skip over this topic. You really can't talk about how to live wisely without talking about an area that is so much part of our lives. And Proverbs does not shy away from it. Large parts of chapter 5, chapter 6, and 7 talk about sex. 
Well, we don't like to talk about sex very much because we just don't handle it very well. But it's all around us. We turn on the TV and what do we see? Satan is taking the hearts of men and is turning them into animals. And that includes ladies also. Pornography is rampant and studies show that 7 out of 10 men between the ages of 18 to 34 visit a pornographic site in a typical month. Pornography affects even those we think it won't affect. A third of the female readers of today's Christian women admitted intentionally accessing internet porn. Half, you're not going to believe this, half of all evangelical pastors admit to viewing pornography in the past year. Divorce lawyers are saying that it's a significant factor in their divorce cases. Well, statistics are fine, but it could be an issue today with someone. How many preachers have you heard about that had affairs and totally ruined their ministry? How many people do you know that have been unfaithful to their loved one? It is a problem and Satan is doing a good job in distracting men and women away from God's perfect design. I have always said, don't get bored. It is dangerous. Sex is a part of our life. And for many of us, it's a struggle. But the consequences are huge for us depending on how we handle ourselves in this area. Well, Proverbs 5 says something we're used to hearing. Again, the Father, the instructor, is calling out to us to hear what he has to say. This is an area of either wisdom or foolishness. We can live skillfully in this area or we can go our own way and do as we please. Proverbs invites us to listen because it has something to say about how to live well in this area. The father is warning his son not to be involved with an adulterous woman. But if the writer had been talking to a young female, he could have written about the adulterous man. Both need to be very careful to hear what the writer has to say in the area of sexual temptation. In fact, what he's going to say applies not only to all sexual temptation, but to all sexual activity that's not with one's husband or wife. We can say that the father is saying that sexual temptation looks very good up front, but there's a cost. Verse 4 says, in the end, she's as bitter as wormwood. There is sweetness, as sweetness at first, but it turns out to be bitter. It is as sharp as a double-edged sword. It cuts and it can hurt. The path of giving into sexual temptation is not one that leads to a good life. It is one that leads to death. That which looks so promising up front ends up leaving you bitter and disillusioned. There's a lie that culture tells us. The lie goes like this. Illicit sex is fun and fulfilling. It promises a lot. It's inviting and exciting. But the truth behind the lie is that illicit sex promises way more than it can actually deliver. Verses 9 through 14 give us the consequences of this kind of sex. You could lose everything, power, years, wealth, and the fruit of your hard-earned labor. There are people who have lost everything. 
their jobs, their money, their family, and their reputation as a result of the illicit sex that looks so alluring up front. It is like this. When you take what is not yours, you can end up losing what is yours. Take what's not yours, end up losing what is. There's a lot at stake. That is why this is so important. It's not enough to know this. There are people who know what's at stake, but who still take the risk despite knowing all the warnings. Well, the first section that uh, Solomon writes uh, is in verses 3 through 6 in our lesson. And it says this, Though the lips of the forbidden woman drips honey, and her words are smoother than oil, in the end she's as bitter as wormwood and as sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps head straight to Sheol. She doesn't consider the path of life. She doesn't know that her ways are unstable. Well, the allure of the immoral woman explains the reason why it was important for the son to hold on to his discretion and to his knowledge. Those things would be tested by the enticements of an immoral woman. Honey is sweet. Oil is pleasant. Honey and oil represent the temptations of immorality. Solomon's phrasing is very poetic and very powerful. The figures of the lips and the words or mouth refer to the words of an immoral woman and what she might use in her enticements and to her alluring kisses. The first steps toward immoral associations are almost always made by what is said or communicated. This speaks of the great need of men, for men and women, to guard their speech and communication with the opposite sex. Oil symbolized gladness and prosperity, and their absence indicated sorrow or humiliation. Solomon focused on the immoral woman, but it was not because he thought that men are always moral or that it is mainly immoral women who seduce and corrupt moral men. Solomon was far too wise and astute in the ways of romance and sexuality to believe that. Solomon focused on the immoral woman because he wrote this to his son and since this was his greatest and closest moral danger. Forbidden or immoral, Women, the adulterous woman, is literally the other woman, someone other than the man's wife. In Solomon's day, some women had the ability to attract and allure men with the sweetness of honey and the pleasantness of oil. Operating outside the covenant of marriage, some of these women use that ability for their own advantage. Our day is like Solomon's, or perhaps worse. Modern Western culture is saturated with images of alluring women and their use of enticement to gain things that are sweet and pleasant to them. The sweetness in the allure of the immoral woman becomes bitter, and her smooth, oil-like pleasantness becomes sharp as a two-edged sword. The image of a two-edged sword, literally a sword with more than one mouth. 
signifies that an association with this woman brings pain and destruction. Eventually, this path of this woman, woman brings death. She promises to add life, but ends up taking it away. The wise man will stay away. The scripture said that her ways are unstable. The decision to entice someone else into immorality is not a decision made by a stable person who desires the best for either self or the one being enticed. Those led into immorality feel they know the motives of their partner in this sin. But Solomon rightly observed, you do not know them. The second section is verses 7 through 11. And it, it's called Think Long Term. And he says this, So now, sons or daughters, listen to me and don't turn away from the words from my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Don't go near the door of her house. Otherwise, you will give up your vitality to others and your years to someone cruel. Strangers will drain your resources and your hard-earned pay will end up in a foreigner's house. At the end of your life, you will lament when your physical body has been consumed. Well, we can sense the serious nature uh, of Solomon's appeal. Perhaps he understood how adultery brought disaster to his father, King David. Solomon didn't advise his son to stay away uh, in the immoral woman's presence and test his ability to resist her seductions. The best defense was distance to not even go near her house. Well, the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful lusts. The longer one stays in the presence of such temptation to evil, the worse the danger becomes. The New Testament echoes this practical advice which could mean in terms of detailed decision, change your job, break with that set of friends that you might have, much like the advice of Dr. Day. Know what to do before you are confronted with such a situation. Solomon will describe many things that are lost through sexual immorality, and he begins with honor. There is a sense of honor that the one who stays pure can have. Once you lose the respect of your loved one, it takes two times, maybe more time, to build that respect again in a relationship. And maybe never ever will you ever gain that relationship of respect again. Disobedience to God's laws always brings sad consequences and sinners eventually pay dearly for their brief moments of pleasure. Adultery and sexual immorality ruin lives. God's command that our sexual relationships remain only in the covenant of marriage. In the covenant of marriage was not given to take away from our life and enjoyment, but to add to it. In the modern world, many men know what it is like to lose their wealth because of adultery. The lament or mourning mentioned is the most excessive kind. The word naum is often applied to the growling of a lion and the hoarse, incessant murmuring of the sea. Sexual immorality leads to disease and the breakdown 
of health. Even the stress of living a double deceptive life is enough to take away one's health. One great price of sexual immorality is regret. When we see how empty the promise of sin are and how great the price for those sins is, deep sorrow and regret is a logical response. Many men and women fallen into the snare of sexual immorality have wondered, how did I ever end up here? When, how could I be so foolish? How could I give up so much for what amounted to so little? Well, verse 14 reads like this. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. What the adulterer thought would remain secret was exposed. He entered his sin thinking no one will ever find out. When it was exposed in the assembly, in the church, let's say, his foolishness, his betrayal, his lack of self-control were made all public. How awful is that? Well, the third section is called Enjoy God's Provision. And this is the last. Verses 15 through 18. It says, Drink water from your own cistern, water flowing from your own well. Should your springs flow in their streets, streams in the public squares, they should be for you alone and not for you to share with strangers. Let your fountain be blessed and take pleasure in the wife of your youth. Solomon was reminding his son that God had provided his wife for his sexual needs. Instead of neglecting what God had given, he should renew his gratitude and focus upon what God had blessed. God's provision for sexual need is found in the marital bed, which is pure before him. Solomon said it is like a pure, fresh spring. It is running water. Though some are dissatisfied with what God provides in marriage, that dissatisfaction is more of a reflection on them than their spouse. Ancient or modern, an over-sexualized satisfaction is mainly a physical sensation. While only a fool would deny the physical enjoyments of sex, a more mature mind sees that intimacy, the open, the unhindered revelation, reception, and sharing of oneself with another is also a great reward in a sexual relationship. When sex is reserved for the biblical boundaries of marriage over the years and decades, it says, I am here for you and you are here for me. I am my beloved's and he or she is mine. I know you more than anyone else and yet I love you. You know me more than anyone else and yet love me? Our children and home life are protected and safe. We are not slaves to our sexual desires. We live by principles greater than our sexual impulses. We will remain together and supportive of each other as we grow old. Isn't that wonderful? I am so thankful for my wife, Giselle. For 42 years, I know you can't believe that, 42 years she has put up with me 
And I am both thankful and blessed to have her in my life. In my eyes, she is perfect. I used to tell her that when uh, we first got married. I'd tell her that all the time. I thought she was almost a prophetess. But through the years, she has been wrong. A few times. Not many. But I still think she is perfect. Especially for me. God bless you.